you couldn't blame the previous administration. <laughs> a new study finds that Americans have on average become several inches shorter in the past hundred years. Scientists say it's mainly because we're all looking down at our phones. <laughs> and by the way, Thanksgiving's coming up very soon. Precious American holiday, and the word holiday comes from the derivation of the old English word holy day, right? Make sure when everybody's sitting around the table, please shut your cell phones off. Nobody's texting each other at the dining room table and stuff like that. That's just sort of a pet peeve I had, you know. I'm old enough to go bring that stuff up. I'm not saying let's go kill all the stupid people. I'm just saying, let's remove all the warning labels and let the problem work itself out. <laughs> you know, like the one that says, don't uh, use this hair dryer while you're in the bathtub. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I changed my car horn to gunshot sounds. People move out of the way much faster. Now. You can tell a lot about a woman's mood just by her hands. If they are holding a gun, she's probably angry. <laughs> Gone are the days when girls used to cook like their mothers, now they drink like their fathers. Hopefully their fathers aren't drinking. You know that tingly little feeling you get when you really like somebody? That's common sense leaving your body. <laughs> I don't like making plans for the day because then the word premeditated gets thrown around in the courtroom. I didn't make it to the gym today. That makes five years in a row. <laughs> I decided to change calling the bathroom the John and renamed it the gym. I feel so much better saying I went to the gym this morning. <laughs> Dear paranoid people who check behind shower curtains for murderers, if you find one, what's your plan? <laughs> Everyone has a right to be stupid. Some just abuse the privilege. And of course, we need to pray for our countrymen. If you will turn to hymn number 352, and by the way, um, just a little bit of education there. They are not page numbers, they're hymn numbers. So hymn number 352, which of course has become in this series of meetings, uh, we'll call it our main theme. And all last week in preparing to come here and in the midst of other ministry we were doing, this just was so strong on my heart for us. And last night as we sang it, we got pretty passionate with it. And so please feel free to be very passionate when you sing this, very determined, you know. When pangs of death seized on my soul unto the Lord I cried. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. I would not be denied. I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. As Jacob in the days of old, I wrestled with the Lord. And instant with the courage full, I stood upon his word. I would not be denied, I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole, oh, I would not be denied. Oh, Satan said my Lord was gone and would not hear my prayer. But praise the Lord, our work is done, and Christ the Lord is here. I would not be denied, I would not be denied, till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. We will have no other king but King Jesus. Amen. Stand with me for the reading of God's word lest you think I only ask Christian people, otherwise known as the saints of God, to stand for the reading of his word. I have spoken at tea party events. I've spoken at all kind of outdoor events and all kind of situations and even where there was the American Atheist Association and I asked them 
to stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and guess what? They did. <laughs> Go figure. We're reading from Hebrews chapter 4, reading from the King James translation today, beginning at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 4, here at verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore remaineth therefore, there remaineth therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then, we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can say amen and please be seated. Amen. Amen. It's interesting what scripture actually says of itself, and by the way, the Bible speaks. It contains everything that we need to know about life and godliness. People have made in my estimation, kind of foolish statement, saying, well, it doesn't say anything about the computer. It doesn't say anything about cell phones. No, but what it does tell us about is everything we need to know about life and godliness, so why don't we read it more? I mean, that's a challenge to all of us, including myself. Now, let's just say as a sub-theme for today's message, the power of one in the presence of the Lord. The power of one in the presence of the Lord. The power of one in the presence of the Lord. Now today, historically, it's called Reformation Sunday. Sad to say that the actual day, October 31st, 1516, when Luther nailed 95, some say 97, indictments. They're called theses, but actually, they're indictments against the church order of the day, and trust me, he risked his life and limb, literally, to put those on the front door of All Saints Church, also known as the Castle Church, in Wittenberg, Germany. He went to the top, so to speak. 
That date is better known to many these days as Halloween, which I consider to be certainly a perversion of the important truth, as so often is the way of the world, that so important a truth gets perverted and the date gets corrupted and so forth and so on. But what happened on that date affected Christians everywhere, then and now, and not only that, particularly for us <coughs> as Americans. So, as we're commemorating the work of one in the presence of <coughs> the Lord, a man named Martin Luther, a German Augustinian monk who took it upon himself, couldn't get a crowd together to do it, he took it upon himself to challenge the established order of things and the corruption of that day. And sometimes we think that what we're facing today is something totally unique. It's not. It really isn't. What Luther faced in that day in terms of corruption within the church, within government, within society, because it was a fallen world then, and only Jesus was the hope to change any of that, and it's a fallen world now, and only Jesus is the hope that we have. Now, when we think about the fact of putting a crowd together, many people ask the question, you know, well, what can we do? And they're waiting until there's enough we's to do it. And what I'm saying this morning to you, and it's obviously important for us to get together, as we have, what a great joy it was. Thank you so much, Brother Rich, for how letting the Lord lead you in that, singing those hymns and whatever else. And people actually were singing them like they weren't old, Amen. and they weren't out of fashion. They're singing with passion. That's why I said, when you asked that question, why I said, well, we just said it. <laughs> right? They said it, and they're saying it. And so did we. We make that declaration. Commemorating the work of one in the presence of the Lord. We even today owe him a great deal, especially here in America, where Reformation theology played a very important part in the war for American independence. And of course, as those of you, if you haven't taken a look at this, please come forward and take a look at this flag that originally came out of Scotland, um, of the people that stood against tyranny, and they realized that standing against tyranny was obedience to God. I know that that is not uh, often taught, I know it's not often preached on, but I can promise you it is a biblical truth. Because we do not <coughs> repay evil with evil, we repay evil with good. And standing against tyranny is a good thing to do. Many of us have in our personal lives. Sometime after the death of the early Protestant, and of course, Protestant, they were protesting. They weren't rioters. You know, like what's going on in our country right now, people say, they're protesting. No, they're not protesting. They're a bunch of rioters. And they're being brought in and paid to riot and start trouble. You know? And who is the author of confusion? Not the Lord. The author of confusion, as you know, is Satan, as Scripture points out. So sometime after the death of the early Protestant uh, reformers like Luther and Swingley and Bucer and Calvin and Melanchthon, a saying developed in Latin that went like this, Ecclesia Semper Reformand, Semper Reformanda. Can you repeat that with me? Did y'all get that? I'll, I'll put it in English. The church is always reformed and always reforming. Regardless of who said it, the idea is very much in keeping with Luther, Luther's notion that there can never be an entirely pure and purified church. Now, let me put in a little caveat here. Don't use that as an excuse to be lazy and slowly and say, let it all hang out like in the 50s when I was growing up, so forth and so on, and it's kind of songs and that, that came out and said stuff. So people would say, well, if it can't be a purified and pure church, then why bother? Well, because the Lord wants you to. And because he wants to use you, and he wants to do things through you. And so, we look at this, it's always a process, even though real reformation, and I tell people the Protestant Reformation is not over. It's still ongoing. In fact, maybe it didn't push quite hard enough at the time, but it's still going on. And as we read, for example, and this is an all-the-time process, always a process, a daily one, as we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where basically the Holy Spirit was saying through the Apostle Paul, I die daily. 
So every day waking up and saying, Lord, I need to be reformed. I'm still in the process of being reformed. Amen. You know, and the idea, think about the word reformed. Okay? The Lord took the dust of the earth and formed that dust of the earth together into a man named Adam and gave him breath of life and so forth. And now we're being reformed to be more in the image of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit continues to renew and reform the church in every age. He got the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Please do not call the Holy Spirit God the Holy Spirit it. He's not an it. He's God the Holy Spirit, part of the Holy Trinity. He, God the Holy Spirit, continues to reform us daily so that we would be conformed to the image of Christ our Savior. Is that your desire this morning? I certainly hope so, because that, I can tell you, is my number one purpose in life. It isn't just evangelism, although that's an important purpose. But one of the greatest things that the Lord does is transform people, right? from what they were to what he wants them to be. You want revival? Well, what I've just described to you, dear ones, that is revival. And of course, we know that the power of one in the presence of the Lord, and no power of hell or darkness can stop that. I would not be denied. How about you? How about you? Amen. 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 Farewell to those who want an entirely pure and purified church. This is plainly wanting no church at all. And of course, <clears throat> I have to ask this question. If everyone in this church was just like me, or if everyone in this church was just like you, what kind of church would this church be? <laughs> Think about that. Your love of liberty, your respect for the laws, your habits of industry, and your practice of the moral and religious obligations are the strongest claims to national and individual happiness. And they will, I trust, be firmly and lastly established. That was said by George Washington in an address to the residents of Boston on October 27, 1789. The power of one in the presence of the Lord. I will not be denied. I think about times with people that are very sick or having different situations, and many of you know some of my history throughout my whole life of accidents and things that have happened and so forth and so on. And the chutzpah, that's the word for guts in Hebrew or in Yiddish, that the Lord gave me in a lot of those things to being able to say, I will not be denied, knowing as we read in scripture, that last verse, and if you're underlining any of the verses, certainly underline that 16th verse in Hebrews chapter 4. Right? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now it's, it's plural. The word is plural. Let us therefore come boldly. Let us. But basically, it is an injunction, if you will, an invitation for us even as individuals. Let me, because I will not be denied, let me come boldly before God's throne of grace in my, my time of need, because that's, in, I'm going to go to his throne of grace, and I will obtain mercy, and I will find grace in t help in time of need. Now other people may not, hey, let's all go together. We do that in church, as we come together in the church. Let's all go together to God's throne of grace. But everyone goes there individually, just like I've told people. There is no group plan for heaven. Mm -hmm. You know that? There is no group plan. I mean, you come to the lighthouse, you hear the word of God preached. I, I appreciate that so much. But it's not the group plan. You know, some churches will try to indicate to you we become a member of this church, and we're all going to heaven on the same bus. Yeah. But that's not what the scriptures teach. And the other thing is, that's very important that we, it's so much important uh, in this, in all of scripture obviously, but in this chapter of scripture, harden not your hearts. 
Many people's hearts have gotten hardened because they spend so much time looking at the fallenness of the world without realizing the power that God has given even the individual that wants to come wholly before God's throne of grace in their time of need. Is our country in the time of need? Yes, there's no doubt about it. Is this the worst time this country has ever faced? Not really. It really isn't. But we do need to be praying. And even individually, if other people don't want to join together and, and go to the throne of grace, you go there yourself. Do not be denied that. That is something the Lord has done for you and done for me. And of course, not hardening our hearts, right? Ceasing from our own works. Verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know, we, we call Christians believers. But you know, a lot of Christians act like unbelievers in a lot of their mannerisms and what they do. In some cases, we've forgotten what it is to really be a believer. And recognizing that believers are going to stand out. And they're going to be in the process of being reformed. You know, why? Because we have the sin of Adam. And because we do need to be reformed. This country needs to be reformed. This country needed to be reformed in 1775 on April 19th on Lexington Green. Needed to be reformed. And there were people that understood Reformation theology that says what? And I mentioned this yesterday to the men in our gathering and then last night a little bit too. What was it that they needed to see as Reformation? First of all, that the king was not law. The law was king. That we are a country that was built on the law of God, not on the law of man. You know, and the law of man is, hey, I got a bad hair day today, and I'm going to hang you. And that's what King George was doing with the Star Chamber, with no due process of law. The things that are built into our code of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, of course, and none of those things would exist without the Declaration. We have certain inalienable rights. And of course, as you look at this flag, rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. You're going to have to rebel in this life, not as a rebel against what's right, but a rebel against what's wrong. That's part of Reformation. 